Hey, welcome to Bible Questions Answered. Man, I'm excited that you guys are with me today. Sorry I couldn't be with you last week. You know, it's uh, it's a busy time of year. Uh, we had Hanukkah. You're thinking, oh, did he celebrate Christmas? I was celebrating Hanukkah. We had a party every night. Just about. Well, just about. But it was a lot of fun. And if you've never celebrated Hanukkah, I encourage you to do it. There's a lot of great spiritual meaning in it. Uh, so check it out. It's pretty cool. There's always next year. Uh, and you can uh, have a lot of fun. All right. Well, we have a lot of questions tonight. Before I get started, I want to let you know, I'm so excited. Drum roll, please. I have finished the second draft of Regenesis. That is my fictional book. A lot of you guys have been following me. Uh, I've heard about that for a long time. You're like, is he ever going to get this thing done? Oh, man. It, you know, it's been a lot of work, I have to admit. <laughs> a lot more than I actually expected. But I'm getting there. All right. So I'm really excited. Uh, I'm now at the stage where I'm having advanced readers uh, that are doing that. So um, I'm delighted that I have some of my patrons on patreon.com that want to help with that. So if that is something that you would like to be part of, uh, you can go over to Patreon. Really any amount, $2 a month, $200 a month, I don't care. Thank you. Uh, shout out to all my patrons. And um, I just appreciate it. And so uh, they're getting the cool chance to look at it before anybody else does. And to just kind of help me, you know, just help shape it a little bit, make sure it's the best book that can possibly be. I'm so excited about this. So pray with me. I wish you, I hope you will. Please pray with me that God will use this to reach a lot of people. I want this to be a movie. That's why I've been praying about getting more faith, right? Because I need lots and lots of faith so that I can make a movie. Like I don't know how to make a movie, but, and I don't have the resources to make a movie, but I know the guy who does, right? God. And so that's one reason I've really been working on a book about faith, right? So that I can, uh, you know, see all these things come to pass. All right, let's get into your questions. And I see that there's a lot of questions in the chat. So I look forward to getting to those as well. Let's, let's get started here. We've got some questions that are from the previous week. So let me jump into those uh, as well. Okay, this is from uh, Ek Legacy. This is, uh, he says, did Trump really say his blood should be in the vaccine? I read the infamous tweet of my blood is the vaccine, and it doesn't seem like he meant that his blood was the cure, but rather he meant something along the lines of his blood immune system is his vaccine, and he doesn't need a foreign substance. It seems like this was taken out of context. Does this, did this really happen? Is, was his blood in the vaccine? Is, was, uh, pig, dog, and rabbit DNA in the vaccine? I cannot find anything online to confirm this. So, Ag Legacy, uh, you're obviously asking about the uh, show that we had on Prophecy Roundtable, where we were asking the question, is Trump the Antichrist? And look, my guest says yes. I, I don't think so. Okay. And for my part, I do not believe that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. Now, <laughs> How should I put this nicely? He's not my favorite guy in the world, all right? He's going to leave it at that. But I don't think he's the Antichrist. What did really come up during that whole show and what I found rather disturbing is that there is so much um, just banter about him uh, being something more than just a human, all right? Uh, and, and that's not necessarily his fault, but it's a lot of the followers, okay? So again, I don't want to rehash that entire program. If you want to go see that, check it out. Prophecy Roundtable, is Trump the Antichrist? Again, my conclusion is absolutely no, but uh, there were some disturbing things. Now, what you bring up is a very important point because there's a lot of stuff online that is not well researched. It's not sourced. It's not vetted. There's a lot of opinions out, out there. Um, you know, and I think this is where you have to be so careful, right? I mean, there's this whole thing, you know, did the Pope replace the Ten Commandments with some green Ten Commandments? No, he didn't replace the Ten Commandments, but he is suggesting that we ought to take care of the planet, and here are these, the quote-unquote Ten Commandments of taking care of the planet, all right? Now, whether you agree with his ideas or not is beside the point. The, the, the question in that regard was, did he replace the 
biblical Ten Commandments? And the answer is no, he did not. All right. So these are the kinds of things that happen a lot. And sometimes, you know what? We Christians are a bit gullible because we are anticipating the end of the world. We're anticipating a guy named Antichrist or whatever you want to call him. And so we're kind of looking for things. And when things seem to kind of fit in there, we try to pigeonhole it in. You ever done a, a puzzle? I, you know, I've done a number of puzzles in my life and I, I find this piece and it looks like it should go in this one particular spot. I mean, and it's so close. And I'm like, ah, oh, come on. It kind of fits. It's so close. It's just a little bit loose, but close enough. Right. Well, all right. I've, I've grown up enough. I've learned enough in my life that you can't do that because if I just try to leave that puzzle piece in there, then that'll mean a whole bunch of other pieces are not going to fit in the puzzle. And that's what we have to be very careful when we're trying to figure out the puzzle called the end times. Because if we start putting one piece in and say, well, this has to fit here, then we're going to find ourselves very uh, frustrated later. <clears throat> later. All right. So um, I don't believe at all that Donald Trump's DN or blood is in the vaccine. All right. I, I don't believe that for a second. So whoever came up with that, uh, I think... It's probably making things up uh, again, regardless of your opinion of Donald Trump. I don't think that that is true at all. All right. This is uh, Justin, not to poke the bear on this subject, but can you speak to your interpretation of Acts 10, 11 through 16 in regards to someone justifying eating Levitical unclean things? All right. And the passage, let me just pull that up for you guys. This is in Leviticus chapter, I mean, excuse me, in Acts chapter 10. And we'll go here. All right. Let me pull that up. One second. Almost got it. There we go. All right. Cool. All right. So, uh, so Peter, and, and he saw a, a heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending and let down on the earth. When in it were all kinds of four footed animals of the earth, wild bees, creeping things, and birds of the air, stuff you're not supposed to eat, right? And a voice came to him saying, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, no, Lord, not so, right? For I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Well, that's a good word, Peter. And the voice spoke to him again the second time, right? What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. All right, now here's the answer. We don't have to look very far for the answer on this one. So I hope you won't just take my word for it. I hope that you will see, or you can maybe share if you're sharing this with somebody. Uh, who is asking this question. I think that's probably more the case. Uh, share this, and I hope you can just take them through it. Say, look, let's just let's just look at this passage and see what it says, okay? So Peter says, no way, Jose. God says, whatever I called, you must, you, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. All right, this is done three times. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius, made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Now, how many did he send? Three guys, right? Behold, three men are seeking you. What kind of men? Mm, what kind of men? Well, these are the kind of guys that a good Jew would not hang out with. Okay. And I'm using that word purposefully. Give me a second here. All right. So let's let Peter, I want to do very little commentary here. I want Peter to explain this. All right. So here's Peter. He's now in Cornelius' house, and he says, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. Where does it say that in Scripture? It doesn't. It doesn't say you can't go visit other people. Look, let, let, let's let's take a, maybe a crude example, but let's take the, the donkey. The donkey, is that a clean animal or an, uh, an unclean animal? Well, it's unclean, right? It's unclean. Can you touch the donkey? Yes. Of course you can touch the donkey. Can you eat the donkey? No. No, you can't eat the donkey. Right? You're not supposed to eat the donkey. That is that's not good. But you can ride the donkey. It's a, a very powerful and necessary animal in the ancient world. That was your basic car back then, okay? That was your your little moped to get around. Uh that's what they used. That's um you know what they that was the basic truck uh was the donkey to carry things, okay? So you just couldn't eat the donkey, but you could, in fact, touch the donkey, all right? So let's make that super duper clear, all right? 
Now, what does Peter say about this? God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection because God showed me. How did God show Peter not to call any man common or unclean? He gave Peter a massive wake-up call in his dream, of course, where he sees this sheet with things that he would never touch. And God says, hey, now it's good, right? But Peter has the dream. He's the owner of the dream. He's the interpreter of the dream. I think we should go with what Peter tells us. Peter doesn't tell us that now he's talking about people and or uh, about animals or food. No, he's talking about people, right? I should not call any man common or unclean. That is the uh, the answer. And Peter himself tells us the answer. So I love it. We don't have to go very far to figure that out. Okay, let's uh, let's go to another question. That was a great one. Thank you, Justin. This is another one from Justin. Uh, could you please tell me if you would eat a, uh, a gyro, 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 however you want to pronounce that, from a restaurant that proclaimed its meat is halal? Wow, uh, that's that's a that's a good question. I um, in the past uh, I have in the past, and then later I got convicted about that, so I didn't. And I would probably, all right. So I would probably stay away from it. Okay, that would probably be my my gut reaction is to not eat from a restaurant that proclaims its meat halal. All right. Now, I know it's kind of a tricky one because nobody said, hey, this was offered to a God, but the word halal does mean that it was blessed in the name of Allah. So, you know, that's a little tricky. And, um, you know, I think this is where you have to say, okay, Lord, guide me. Uh, this one is maybe. Maybe this is a kind of a gray area. Maybe it's not. Uh, but you know, help show me what what I have to do here. Where do I what do I have freedom and what don't I have freedom? Now Paul tells us, I think very clearly. He's like, look, those things are nothing, right? These so-called false gods are nothing, and meat, so so long as it's uh, it's you know clean, right? But meat that has been offered to an idol, it it didn't change. It didn't change that. The probably the real thing to understand is if you eating there would cause another brother to stumble, then you probably don't want to do that, all right? Um, if it's just you, you yourself and you, and you go and you eat there and no one's concerned about it, I don't think it's probably a big deal, okay? So again, it's a little bit of a gray area, in my opinion. Um, I think you're probably, I don't think you're gonna get struck by lightning if you eat there, and I don't think you're gonna necessarily cause a brother to stumble, but if it does become something where you're hanging out with another brother and he's like, man, I just could never eat halal meat because that was sacrificed to an idol. That is where Paul says, okay, then don't do it. All right. Because we don't want to cause that other brother to stumble if he's thinking about this. But Paul makes it very clear. And I agree with Paul that, um, you know, nothing, subs nothing substantially changed for that meat. It's still the same basic meat. And, and these so-called gods are, in fact, they are nothing when we get right down to it. All right, so that's a tough one. All right, uh, Diana asks, are you familiar with Bishop Usher's work in Annals of the World? If so, how confident are you in his chronologies, particularly the specific dates of creation and the specific dates of Yeshua's earthly ministry? So, Diana, it's been a while since I've read uh, Usher's uh, work. Um, I I would say that, oh boy, <laughs> this could get me some some, well, anyway. Um, so yeah, he, he puts the creation of the earth at 4,004 BC. All right. And, um, most of my life I have been a young earth creationist. And I would say that I typically, you know, generally speaking, I still am a young earth creationist. Um, I'm not dead set on 6,000 years, but I do think the earth is uh, much younger than say, you know, 4.56 billion years old or something like that. Okay. I don't think that's a necessary number at all. And there's lots of reasons to go into that. All right. So, but is it as young as only 6,000 years? Well, you know, I can't be sure. Um, I, I can't be sure. And I, I'm not positive that it's worth arguing about that, even though I, I do kind of have a horse in that race to some degree. I even wrote a book on it, the first six days, and I argue there 
for a literal interpretation of of the earth um, or, uh, you know, a literal interpretation of the word day. OK, so if you're interested, that book is called The First Six Days. It's on Amazon. You can check it out. Um, and as far as the specific dates of Yeshua's earthly ministry, look, I think those are also very challenging. But again, he puts it. Uh, I don't know if it's 29 BC or AD or 32 AD. I would say we're definitely in the ballpark in there, but I think you can make uh, nuanced changes or arguments for either of those dates. And that's probably where I would sort of draw a byline. Okay. Uh, another question, Diana asks, why is a woman unclean for so much longer after giving birth to a daughter than she is after bearing a son. Is this somehow a residual consequence of the original sin? Well, Diana, the, the Bible does not specifically state why a woman is unclean longer for having a daughter. So I'm gonna all I can do is, is offer you my best guess on this one. Um, first of all, uh, I think it's kind of cool that the woman gets, you know, either a month off for a boy or six weeks off for a girl, right? Because well, I've never had children, but, um, you know, <laughs> when we did have kids, uh, I know that it was very difficult and, um, having time off and not have to go back to work and get, just be by yourself and be unclean. And, you know, there's something there now there could also be something in the woman's body that is causing her to potentially, uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, forgive me guys if I get my terminology wrong. Okay. But you know, there's a lot of bleeding going on. So it could be that there's something uh, in the, in the estrogen because she's also had a little girl that maybe she doesn't heal quite as fast. All right. So that could be one thing. Um, and let's see beyond that. I mean, I think it, it probably is genetic to some degree. There might be something in the Y chromosome, but I am not, from the baby boy, of course, I'm talking about. Um, but I don't know, right? And this is beyond my expertise, okay? So I, I can only give you thoughts, and I might be wrong on those thoughts. All right, another question from Diana. She says, uh, I struggle with this one sometimes. John, uh, being referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved, we know that God does not play favorites. He loves us all and loved all the disciples, Judas included equally, but even according to scripture, he seems to have found the most potential or zeal, for lack of better terms, in Peter. So why this term, the disciple whom Jesus loved? Well, certainly when we find that term in the book of John itself, right? So I think that's one of John's way of sort of taking a, a humble approach to this whole thing. Instead of always saying, John did this and John did that, uh, he's just kind of saying the one that Jesus loved. Right, so that does not exclude the others from the ones whom Jesus would loved, you know, that he loved. Okay, so, um, you know, I think if we're going to start getting into logical arguments and we have to say, well, wait a second, you know, he didn't say that he didn't love the others, he just said that he did love this disciple, right? And it kind of gives that impression, but I, I, I think that probably would be the wrong conclusion if we suggested that Jesus only loved John. But John was close to Jesus, right? And he seems to have been closer. Than the others, maybe because they were cousins. That could be, um, it could be one reason. Uh, I'm just thinking about that, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that they were cousins. And um, you know, the other, you know, John was one of the the three: Peter, James, and John. Right? They were the three that got to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Mount Hermon. Right? So that was really special. And you know, John was there when Jesus was on the cross. Nobody else was there. Peter wasn't there. So there really was something special about John. And I don't think that it's Jesus was pay, playing favorites with John as so much as John was really hanging out with Jesus. Like John was pressing in to Jesus. We're told that, you know, if we seek him, he'll seek us. And, and uh, if we deny him, well, he is still faithful. But ultimately, he'll deny us if we uh, if we don't seek his face. Right. So that's, um, you know, again, I don't think that it's it's a favoritism thing. I think that John positioned himself to be there. There could have been some familiar uh, relationship that was going on, and that may have uh, helped and kind of given John the reason to say that the disciple that Jesus loved. And John was writing the book, right? Okay, this is from Carol. 
Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through him. What then happens to Old Testament saints who never heard of Jesus but obeyed God? Well, um, Carol, as far as I read, uh, I see Jesus in the Old Testament all the time, right? So um, let's go to a passage. Let me bring this up for you guys. So let's see here. It is, um, hold on. Um, yeah, so it is uh, Genesis, I'm trying to think of it. Um, let me just look it up. It's either 47, let's see. My mind is blanking. Let's uh, see if I can spell here. I'm working on it. All right. Bless the lads. Here we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So, all right. I was right, but I didn't think about it. All right. So God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. See that? See that God, right? God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. The God who has fed me all my life long to this day. Hmm. So we have God. We've got God. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads. Wait, who do you want to bless the lads? Is it God, the God of Abraham and Isaac? Is it the God who fed him all the days of his life? Or is it the angel who redeemed him from all evil? Or is the angel, in fact, God? And that's the conclusion I would come to, that the angel is, in fact, God, right? And so that means, who was the angel that Jacob was wrestling with? That was God. And who was that specifically? That was Yeshua. That was Jesus, All right? So Jesus is very much in the Old Testament, okay? He's very much in the Hebrew Bible. So per your question, everyone comes to the Father through Jesus, right? So nothing has really changed. It's always been through Jesus. It's still through Jesus, except when he came in the flesh, well, there you go. He came in the flesh, and that was the big difference. Otherwise, he'd still been coming. Right? We find him in the book of Judges, right? The angel of the Lord. We, of course, find him in the burning bush with Moses, right? All these different times, we find that angel, and he's called God, very much so. And um, that we understand that to be a Christophany, a, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament, right? So, um, I think it's pretty darn awesome <laughs> that Jesus has been there uh, and nothing has really changed. Okay, this is from uh, Dean. Uh, how would you read Jeremiah 8, 15 through 16? Do you believe he is speaking about the Antichrist? Could he come from the tribe of Dan? A couple early church fathers like Arrhenius and Hippolytus thought so. What are your thoughts? Okay, so let's go to Jeremiah chapter 8. Um, so. Yeah, well, let's let's go there. I think that's probably the, the easiest thing. Jeremiah 8, 15. All right. So, we looked for peace, but no good came, and for a time of health, and there was trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. Um, I don't really see anything that's referring to the Antichrist in this passage. Um, I think, I don't know, I'm not sure where that idea came from. It, I, obviously, probably there's some teacher out there that is suggesting that, well, as you just told me, sorry, <laughs> you just told me, right, Hippolytus and Arrhenius. I, I'm not in agreement, and I don't necessarily think that the Antichrist is going to be a, a Jew, uh, as so many people have said. Um I, I just don't think that he has to be Jewish. In fact, if you go to Israel today, you will find that most Jews do not believe that the, the Messiah um, is, well, they do believe that he will be from the, the um, well, again, so it gets complicated. Some of them think he will be from the, uh, be a son of David, but others are not convinced that he has to necessarily be Jewish, right? So they have different opinions on this uh, very widely varying opinions about who the uh, who the Messiah is going to be. So assuming that that would be the anti-Messiah, right? So uh, yeah, I just, I just don't, I just don't see that uh, at all. Um, but um, so let's see here. I wanted to uh, just, this is from uh, Jason. 
Uh, thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. Thank you for teaching God's wisdom. Well, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you for the encouragement there. Um, I will continue to do my best. All right. That's all I can promise. <laughs> I'll continue to try to do my best. All right. Let's go to another, another question. Um, this is a great question. What do you think of the teaching that the Magi were Israelite descendants of the Babylonian exile who had remained in Babylon, brought up knowing the prophecy of Yeshua's miracles, uh, miraculous birth, and entrusted with treasures handed down by Daniel, who had no offspring, thus stored up the gifts that were handed down and brought to Messiah when the prophetic signs appeared in the sky? I relate this as a possibility, but we don't know how true it is. I think it's a very plausible possibility, but like you said, we don't know, right? And so, you know, sometimes it really is a lot of fun to try to fill in the gaps. I, I get it, but we, to my knowledge, we don't have that information that would tell us, um, you know, exactly who they were. Now, if somebody knows better, if you have information about that and we can really trace who these guys were, hey, I'm fine with that. I think I first heard that theory from Chuck Missler uh, many years ago, and I think it's a very plausible theory. But plausible doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. It means that, well, it's possible. It, it's, there's a good chance that that could be true, right? It's probable. But um, but as far as proving it, there's another matter, right? Okay, let's get to another question. There's so many good ones. I want to get to them all. Is gambling a sin? <laughs> Robert asked that. Is gambling a sin? Well, Robert, let's think about gambling. Uh, you know, So I know what you're talking about. You're talking about maybe going to play cards or go to the casino or do slot machines or anything like that. Um, no, gambling in and of itself is not a sin, right? But gambling uh, is probably very unwise, right? So I remember when I was in um, I was in uh, Las Vegas, and I remember seeing, you know, it says right on the sign that they have like a 98% payback or something like that. And I'm like, you know, they're telling you the odds that you're guaranteed to lose 2%, right? If all the collective whole is going to lose 2%, then you know most people are going to lose and only a few people maybe two percent will actually win maybe okay um so they're telling you the odds right up front so you know really life is a gamble we do not know the outcome we don't have a crystal ball we all wish that we could just look into it and say oh this is what exactly what i need to do but life is a gamble right we make investments and when we when we make an investment maybe you're going to buy a house you're going to buy a business what are you going to do first you're going to do your research right because you don't want to just throw in $100,000 and you know that you have 0.000% chance of it actually, 0.1, right? Percent chance of it actually working. You, you're really wanting better odds, right? You're hoping that if you invest $100,000, the odds are that you are going to get your money back. Maybe it's a you know 60% return. Maybe it's a 70%, 80% likelihood that your business will succeed, okay? So when you go to a casino or something like that, your odds are very low, right? They're very low. Now, some people make um, playing cards, poker, they make that their career. And I, you know, some people do quite well. Well, they have obviously in, invested in themselves. They've done a lot of training, whatever that looks like, I don't know, but they've somehow learned to increase their odds so that if you're going to do that as a profession, you, you've got to be able to make some money, right? So somehow they have learned to do that. I do not have that skill. So, you know, for me, it'd be not, it wouldn't be a gamble. It'd almost certainly be a loss. Okay. So when you're going to start putting money in things like a slot machine, what are your odds? Now, some years ago I went, uh, did some slots and, um, I think I spent all of $6 and, it wasn't a gamble for me because I was getting free drinks. <laughs> so I figured, you know what, uh, for the $6, I would have spent that on drinks anyway, you know, so they kept bringing, I don't know, soda or whatever. And, uh, it seemed like a pretty decent trade. Okay. So I wasn't trying to win. All right. Now you can buy uh, lottery tickets and you know what, if you want to spend, I don't know, what do you ever you spend on lottery tickets nowadays, a dollar, $5, whatever. If, if that makes you happy. Okay. You know, I don't think that that's wrong to do that. But just understand that the odds of you winning are very, very low, unless you have some special system that you can share with me, right? But um, so gambling in and of itself is not a sin, but it may be very unwise. Okay, so some things are not always sinful. They're just stupid. 
And that is my humble opinion about uh, gambling. Unless you have lots of money and you don't care and you're just going for a good time and you don't care if you lose a thousand dollars in a weekend, you're like, I'm good with that. If, if you have that kind of money to burn through, well, then you have the right to, to spend your money that way. Now, again, it may not be a good investment. It may not even be a wise way to blow your money. But if you've got that kind of money to blow, then, then you, as far as I can tell, you have the right to do that. But most people that are going there, especially playing slots, they're really trying to strike it rich, right? And they keep thinking, I'm going to get into this. And so for them, I think it can become a sin, especially when they're using money that should be used for the family or for the rent or the health insurance or, you know, the kid's education. And they're blowing it at the casino. That then be, becomes a sin because they become a very bad steward. Okay. So two different things. One is just pure gambling. That's not a sin. But two, I'm a steward of the money I have. And then I'm going to use it for this. That's probably a sin. All right. So great question. <laughs> that's really a good one. All right. This is from Virginia. In terms of the necessary two witnesses from scripture for the snatching away or the rapture, wouldn't the stories of Lot and his family and of Noah and his family qualify as witnesses? I realize they aren't direct prophetic declarations. Thank you. Uh, Virginia, uh, I appreciate your question. And um, I, I get the sense, maybe I'm maybe I'm misreading this whole thing, but I get the sense that you may be a, uh, a pre-trib rapturist. And I really appreciate you bringing the question to me when I'm not. Okay, so I, I do appreciate that. So I'm going to answer as gently as I possibly can uh, on this particular topic. But uh, if you go and you look at uh, guys like, um, um, <laughs> gosh, Hal Lindsey, okay, he's one of the, the big ones, right? They're like great planet Earth, all right? Or if you do Tim LaHaye, right, left behind, 65 million copies sold of that. These are the two big voices, the biggest voices, in my opinion, of the pre-trib rapture. And they both admit that there is no verse. There's no direct reference to a pre-trib rapture. So there's one thing to have, you know, shadows of things, but what casts a shadow? A real object, right? When you go out on a bright sunny day and maybe the sun's behind you and then your cat, your shadow is cast. Why is it cast? Because you're, there you are. You can touch right here. I am right. I'm real. I'm substantive. I'm physical. I'm a real dude. And then because the, the, the sun is coming behind me, I'm now casting a shadow. So we can talk about my shadow only only in respect to me. If there's no me, then there's no shadow of me. If there's not a tree, then there's not a shadow or shade of a tree. There has to be the real thing. And so what so many pre-tribbers have done is they use the shadows as evidence of the thing. But if there's no thing, and it's not stated for us in scripture, then you can't talk about shadows. That's just not how it works. You've got to have the real thing uh, in order for it to be there. And with such a huge doctrine, such a life-altering doctrine as the pre-trib rapture, there really should be something definitive for us in Scripture. Now, uh, in my book, Reclaiming the Rapture, that I co-authored with Chris Steinle, um, you can get that uh, on my website, douglasamp.com, or you can go to amazon.com and get that as well. And pray for me because I want to do an audiobook of that really soon. <laughs> All right. So what we show is that when it comes to verses that talk about the gathering, there are so many. Okay. Let me show you just a couple of the passages. I'm not going to go through a lot because I don't have time to go through a lot of these verses. But I want to show you one. This is from Paul. Okay. I'm even saying that with special emphasis in my voice because Paul is supposed to be the guy. That, that's really talking about the rapture, okay? But notice what he says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. All right, so the, the, the coming of our Lord and the gathering of our Lord, he talks about both of these in the same breath, right? Because they're going to both happen. When Jesus comes, that is when he gathers us. Who else said something to that effect? Oh, let me think. Hold on. We know him. <laughs> Drum roll. Jesus, right? Jesus said this in Matthew 24. 
immediately after the tribulation of those days, all the stuff's going to happen. Then the sign of the Son of Man is going to come, all right? And they're going to see him coming on the clouds. Jesus coming, right? Paul said concerning the coming of our Lord, right? He said that. And what's he going to do? He send out his angels, and they will do what? They will gather, right? That's what Paul said, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord and our gathering to him. So Paul is not saying something new. He's saying something old that Jesus had already said. And even Jesus is not saying something new. We have the term gathering or gather uh, used so many times in Scripture. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, let's go to Isaiah chapter uh, 11. There we go. Verse 12. All right. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble, assemble, gather, same word, the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Right. And that's where Jesus is going to send out the angels and they're going to do the same thing. They're also going to gather his, his angels will gather them from the four winds of heaven, four corners of the earth. Same thing, right? So Jesus was not saying something new. He was saying something that had already been prophesied. So that's three verses for you right there that talk about the gathering. So now when we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we should not interpret that in and of itself isolated from all these other passages, but we need to interpret it in light of and in harmony with all of these other passages, and we see that the pre-trip, the, the timing of a rapture before the beginning of the tribulation is based on nothing. It's based on air, and that's exactly what Tim LaHaye and Hal Lindsey both admit, right? And, and as do other teachers, they admit that, that there's nothing to it. It's Unfortunately, it's all smoke and mirrors, and that's why I had to let go of that doctrine, even though I wish it were true, and I would much prefer the pre-trib rapture. I think it's a much better way to go. And you know what? If I'm wrong, everybody can tell me, told you so on the way up. I'm okay with that. All right. Really? <laughs> I'm totally fine with saying, told you so on the way up. Uh, I don't care. You know, I'll eat humble pie all the way up to heaven if that's the case, but I don't see it in scripture. And if I don't see it in scripture, then, well, I don't think we have much to stand on. Scripture is what we stand on. And if we can't stand on that, then there's nothing to stand on. Okay. Um, another question. Also, could you please review the verses that you gave as witnesses for the rapture and where do the people of God go? Well, I think I just did that. Uh, so appreciate your follow-up question there. I think I just did that. Where do the people go? Well, when Jesus comes, he's going to gather them and then do what? He's going to hang out on planet Earth with them, right? So we're going to have a thousand years where we're going to be hanging out on planet Earth and really all eternity for that matter. Um, but he's going to set up his kingdom and we're going to be part of that. And I can hardly wait. All right, this is from Sean. Uh, I may have asked before, I believe the rapture and second coming are the same event or at least back to back. What is your opinion? So thank you, Sean. Uh, I did just answer that. So uh, that's that's a great question. Uh, this is from Iris. Hebrews 8, 1 through 5, verse 5, verse 5 says, they serve and shadow of the heavenly if the earthly tabernacle and its duties are a copy of the heavenly. Do you think there are sacrifices being done in heaven? Well, uh, Iris, let's take a look at the passage that would probably give us the greatest insight on that. Okay, this is in Isaiah chapter 6. All right, so in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Temple, there you go, right? Where is God? He's in a temple, God sitting in a temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, right? So we have the, the seraphim, cherubim. I think seraphim and cherubim are exactly the same thing, but that's not the question right now, but I think they're exactly the same thing, right? Uh, on the mercy seat, the, the kapoet, right? You have the cherubim, right? And that's where the, the presence of God would be on the Ark of the Covenant. So this is, this is the heavenly picture of what it really looks like, right? And so the copy, the, the earthly copy, is a copy of this that we're seeing right here in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, so with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew, and one cried to another, said, Holy, 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 kadosh, 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 is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the doors of the post were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, or woe am I, for I'm undone. 
because I'm a man of unclean lips, I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, Lord of hosts. All right, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. So we have an altar there. Okay, now per your question, are there animal sacrifices happening in heaven? No, no. And hallelujah that there are not any animal sacrifices happening in heaven. Okay. So uh, Hebrews chapter eight, I'm going to go there. All right. So chapter eight. Um, okay. So this is a shadow, right? He's, and okay, I want to go to chapter nine. Okay. So what did he do? He went in, right? What did he do? He went in with blood. Now, this is what the high priest did. So what did Yeshua did? But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. All right, so which one did he go to? The one we just read about in Isaiah chapter 6. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all. So he did it once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of, purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. All right, so you had all the, the uh, trappings of the temple, but it didn't have a sacrifice. And so Jesus took his blood once, for all, right? So it hadn't been done before that. There were not animals that were being sacrificed up there. Uh, that was something that was done as a stop gap measure uh, for a time down here on earth. Why? So that God and man could hang out together. I've talked about this before on the show, but God is a consuming fire. Like really, like seriously, he's got fire, okay? So if you try to get too close to him, guess what? You burn up. Check it out. I mean, there's so many times when people got, you know, sort of on the wrong side of God and they got toasted. Uh, Nadav and Abihu, they got toasted because they brought strange fire into the temple and that is, or the tabernacle, and then they got toasted, sadly, right? But it has to be done properly because God is a consuming fire. He's not joking about that. That's not just a uh, hyperbole or something. That's for real, all right? Uh, if you want to check out more, you can see Daniel chapter 7 and Ezekiel chapter 1. All right, for more on that question. Cool. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, and nice. Okay, let me get to the questions that are in the chat. I'm looking forward to taking these. All right, this is from Chris. Who are the elective God? Uh, are they the ones that God determined who will be saved? Are they a special class of Christians whom God chose in eternity or something different? Uh, and continued. He says, uh, are, they, are there any non-elect Christians who will also be saved and chosen for eternity? Right. Well, Chris, this is a great question, and there's a lot to it. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in your question. So we're going to go really quickly. I'm going to give you the, the bird's eye view here of this question. So Deuteronomy chapter 7. All right, so what does he say? He says, for you are a holy people. Who is he talking to? Here he's talking to the the entire kingdom of Israel. It's not a kingdom yet, right? But it's the entire people of Israel, right? And he says, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure. So who did God choose? He chose Israel, okay? God chose Israel. The word here is bacha. Uh, in Greek, it's eklegome. It's the same exact word. Uh, you have the word eklektos, which are the chosen, but the word to choose is eklegome in the Greek. And uh, it's the same exact thing. So who did God choose? He chose Israel, right? Now, not only the Jews, they're part of it, right? But this all 12 tribes, he chose all 12 tribes and anybody who would be incorporated into that. See that? Anybody who would be incorporated into Israel, they became part of the chosen people, right? Right? And it's purely grace, right? The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, right? So that's why he did it. Not because you deserved it, but because of God's incredible grace. 
right? So the idea of grace is not something new. It's very, very old idea. Like it's always been around because God has always been gracious. He's always been loving. So this is why I and um, several others who are on the Commonwealth of Israel Foundation, we're on the board, uh, and we wrote a book. Um, but um, we we came to, we sort of all came to this on a, in our own different way, which was kind of fun, uh, that, that we are part of Israel. We're part of the Commonwealth of Israel. And that's why we chose that term, because Paul already gave us that idea. Here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, right? So Gentiles, you Gentiles, you were, you see that right there? You were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So you're no longer, you're no longer strangers and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You're now part of, I'm now part of the commonwealth of Israel. So I become part of the chosen people, right? So unfortunately, what what um, the two big systems that we have, which is dispensationalism versus replacement theology or reformed theology, or some people would call covenant theology, well, they're all basically one and the same thing. They would suggest that, well, the dispensationalists would say, well, that the Jews over there are the chosen people, and the church, well, somehow, you know, we're the, the special dispensation, and God's got this special plan for us. Whereas the Reformed Covenant theologians would say, no, 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 no. Um, all of the promises God made to Israel have not been transferred to the church, hence the church has replaced Israel. And what we're saying in Commonwealth theology is, no, it's always been Israel, and now I, as a Gentile who believe in Jesus, I get to come into the Commonwealth of Israel. And so now I become part of the chosen people, all right? So it, it's a small thing, but has huge ramifications as to how you see so many of these different things. All right, now if you want to learn more about that, I did write a paper on my website, douglasam.com, why God did not choose Calvinists, all right? So that was kind of a fun paper. Um, if you want to check that out, I also have a video to that same title, why God did not choose Calvinists, uh, on my um on my uh on my channel all right so uh so check that out okay let's keep on moving we've got another question here so this is oops i thought i brought it up there it is okay this is average joe hello pastor doug can someone who has the holy spirit lose it later in life or is it something that will never be taken away after it's received so uh joe i'm presuming you're talking about the indwelling of the holy spirit versus the epi experience. We do see David saying, you know, take not your Holy Spirit from me. And uh, as I've been teaching through the book of First Samuel, we, we had a very sad chapter, chapter 16, where God took the Holy Spirit that was on Saul and he put it on Daniel. All right. And now I'm, uh, I'm going to be teaching through uh, 18 and 19 this week. And it kind of cracked me up when uh, Saul sent some men to try to uh, get David, who was hanging out with Samuel, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them, <laughs> all these guys that were sent. Then Saul himself went, and the Holy Spirit fell on Saul as well, right? It's kind of a funny, funny thing there. Um, so so that experience of the Holy Spirit, where God, he comes on, and then he can go off, that is what we call the epi experience. Uh, where we talk about the, the indwelling, so far as I can tell, um, I don't think that's something that you can just sort of lose, but there are people that have truly believed in Jesus, and then they truly don't, and they don't want anything to do with Jesus. So that begs the question, uh, you know, are they once saved, always saved, even against their will? If they don't want to be saved and they have denied the Lord, they rejected him. It's not like they just had a, a moment of, oh, uh, you know, is God really out there? Some kind of thing. But they're like, no, I, you know, whether he's out there or not, I do not want him. Right? If, if, 
there are people that come to that conclusion. And Charles Templeton was one such guy that used to be very much an evangelist like Billy Graham, and he became a, uh, a hardcore atheist. So is he still saved, even though he didn't want to be later in life? I don't think so. Uh, and in fact, we read in uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10, that if we then you know put the blood of Christ underfoot, it doesn't seem so, so positive uh, in that sense. But I would encourage you, if you're worried about this, and you're like, oh man, Lord, I love you so much, but I know I blow it. I don't think you have anything to worry about. As long as your heart is tender to the Lord, I think you'll be just fine. Okay. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't stress over that. Okay. <laughs> that would be, that'd be my counsel to you. I hope, I hope that's, uh, encouraging. All right. Um, let's see. Looks like I got some of these questions. Okay. What do you think about the believed finding Sinai in Saudi Arabia? Um, Ari, I think that's probably a, a pr you know, I think that's more than likely where it is. Uh, I've been to Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula, the so-called Mount Sinai that was found by uh, Constantine's mother, Catherine. And it was interesting. It was a fun visit, but was it the actual place? Eh, probably not. So I'm, I'm very persuaded that what is going on, what they found in Saudi Arabia, which is called uh, Jabal Musa, right? It's called the Mountain of Moses. Um, they also found that it's burned on top. They found a split rock. That seems pretty, pretty compelling in my book. Now, is it absolutely? I don't know, but it seems very, very compelling uh, that uh, that's probably it. So, um, very good. Okay, let's get to another question. This is from Tyler. Did Mary have other children or did she stay a virgin? I tend to think she had others because. Uh, of the text with Joseph. Well, she definitely did have other children. In fact, there's a day when Jesus' brothers and sisters come to visit, right? So uh, it's the Catholic Church that has taught us that she remained a perpetual virgin. In fact, they go even a step further and suggest that she was immaculate, that she, um, you know, that she was sinless uh, all of her life, and that's just not at all the case. But um, she was a virgin before she had Jesus. She had Jesus, and then Joseph and Mary had normal sexual relations like every other married couple out there. Um, and they had other kids, right? So very much, you know, be fruitful and multiply, right? So Jesus was not their only child. Um, okay, <laughs> very good. Uh, awesome. I got through all the questions. This is so exciting. And I got four minutes to spare. This is really, really cool. So, uh, guys, thank you again. Uh, keep me in prayer. The book, Regenesis, it's coming. I'm so excited. I've been working on this for years. I mean, mm, and I keep saying, oh, it's coming, but man, I'm really close. So if you want to be an advanced reader, uh, the way to do that is to become a patron. And again, you don't, it doesn't be much. I'm not, I'm not trying to get a bunch out of you, but that way I just kind of know that you're, you're in, uh, that this is something that's valuable to you right? Because um, it's it's valuable to me, right? This book is something I've worked, I've worked so hard on. And I want to, I want to entrust it with people that are, uh, that are into this. Okay. So if you want to be an advanced reader, uh, just go to patreon.com forward slash Doug Hamp. And again, you know, little or as much as you want. And I would greatly appreciate if you could help me um, and just give me your early feedback because I want this book to rock. All right. That's the plan. Okay. Well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. And I will see you next week.